Oh my gosh. Hello, hello, hello. Did you miss us? Did you think we weren't coming? We're obviously coming. We miss you. Of course we're coming. Like, we have to be here. Uh, we're so excited that you're here. Um, my name is Dr. Jedida Eisler. I am elated to be in the room with you virtually today. Um, I'm an astrophysicist by training. Wait, did I say welcome to On the Vanguard Conversations with Women of Color and Non-Binary People of Color in STEM? Y'all, uh, it's the February edition, Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. Happy Black Legacy Month. Happy Black Futures Month. Like we out here in these streets just being Black all the time. And we're very excited about it. Anyway, um, we're currently I am an assistant professor of astrophysics at Dartmouth College uh, and founder of Vanguard STEM. Uh, mostly just fangirl of all the people we get to talk to on this show. So without further ado, let me pass the mic to my co-host so we can get into it. We're so excited. Hi everyone, my name is Anika Harriet, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland School of Medicine where I study biochemistry and molecular biology. And I'm so thrilled to be the co-host of On the Vanguard tonight. I also wanted to send special shout outs to the rest of the Vanguard STEM team, uh, especially Geraldine Ezeka, who is live tweeting. If you would like to engage, you can tweet at Vanguard STEM with any questions or comments that you may have or comment down below and someone on our team will see that and we'll be able to engage with you there as well. Um, thank you also to Miranda Bethune and the rest of the Vanguard STEM teams and the Tech Bridge Girls theme, uh, teams as well for making this happen. Uh, before we get started, of course, I have to remind everyone to like this video and subscribe and also to check out conversations.vanguardstem.com for all of our content and uh, our, our all of our content and all of our articles about the things that we've had going on this month as we've celebrated Black histories and Black futures. So as you're tweeting, liking, subscribing, and commenting below, I would also just like to remind everyone of the Vanguard STEM rules of engagement. So by interacting with Vanguard STEM, you're expressing your interest to enter into a sacred space of healing, community, and gathering for Black and Indigenous people of color and women and non-binary people of color in STEM. Vanguard STEM was explicitly built to center these folks and we've opened up to share that magic with everyone in the STEM community. And so we want to make sure that you're not misusing or abusing this space. Um, and we reserve the right to boot anyone out who is engaging in any sort of isms or phobias. Um, and with that said, I think that we can get started with the rest of our wonderful show content. Oh, snap. Rules have been set, stages have been laid. This obviously goes the other way, but whatever. I'm excited, I can't help it. Um, but let's get the context setting going. So what are we talking about today? Uh, our show is about Black histories and Black futures. We really want to think about the ways that we nurture STEM identity. We're really excited to have this episode because it allows us to really think about, you know, how STEM identities are formed, nurtured, and then excel and thrive. Uh, particularly, we're interested in intersectional STEM uh, identities, that is to say, folks that come from uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, uh, non-binary communities, queer communities, uh, disabled communities, all of the different ways that one can show up and be a scientist without giving up any of their identity. So we're really trying to uh, underscore this anti-oppressive generative way of being who you are in this space. Um, and our guest list is bananas. We can't wait to share them with you. But just to give you a little context of how the show is gonna go, we're gonna spend the first part of our show talking with our esteemed guest who you can see, oh, you can't see, she's hidden from you right now, but she's coming to your screen in like five seconds. Um, about the work of nurturing STEM identities from in girls at, starting as early as sort of like elementary school, moving out through uh, the different age groups. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have a whole second segment of our show that's all about our VS Gets Lit campaign, where we're going to talk about our first feature book um, author, um, 
and her book. So we're, we're really excited to re actually walk you through what nurturing STEM identity is through our guests, uh, through their work, um, and through their commitment to building something that is not reproducing of oppression, but really freeing the communities we care most about uh, from that themselves. So uh, two pieces to this wonderful puzzle. The conversation goes on in social media. Anika said it before, but just to underscore, please feel free to subscribe. Uh, hit whatever the buttons are. I haven't gotten good at that game yet, but hit the buttons. Uh, chat with us in our thing and we're really excited to hear from you. So without further ado, I will introduce our first guest of the evening, Nicole Collins Pori. She is a social justice visionary, strategist, advocate, and mentor who has committed her life to unleashing the potential of untapped communities. She is the CEO of TechBridge Girls, which is a nonprofit organization that excites, educates, and equips girls from low-income communities through STEM to empower them to pursue STEM careers and achieve economic mobility uh, and financial security as adults. Nicole holds a BA in political sciences from the University of South Florida and an MPA from the City University of New York. And we are so thrilled to be chatting with Nicole today on On the Vanguard. Thank you so much for having me. Can I just take a moment and just like breathe all of this like lack of brilliance and excellence in? So I'm feeling a little nervous because I'm in the midst of like, physicists and engineers and all of the STEM greatness. And I, you know, I'm coming from a poli sci master's in public administration. So I have to say you all are intimidating me a little bit right now, but I am like just totally um, loving this moment to be in your presence because as often as we sometimes know, like people are like, well, where's the black and brown talent, you know, for the industry? And I'm like sitting in it. I'm like poured all over it. And if I could see your viewers right now, you would just be magnifying my heart even more. So thank you for having little old me in the discussion today, because I think I am in more of all of each one of you um, because of your path your persistence and your just passion to be in this space and to transform it at the same time. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being willing to join us this after this evening to talk a little bit more about what you do and what Tech Bridge Girls is. So I think we should probably get the conversation started there, uh, especially for anyone who hasn't seen your Future Fridays feature that we put out at the beginning of the month. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what Tech Bridge Girls is and the work that you do? Of course. Well, for 20 years, Tech Bridge Girls has really understood that girls of color girls who experience economic insecurity or gender expansive youth lack nothing in their ability, willingness, interest, know-how to not only tap into the STEM industry, but revolutionize it. And what we really try to attack is that it's not our girls that need to be the focus point, but it's everything around them that is preventing their ability to access quality STEM education that centers their experience, their identity, their lineage, their culture. It's about creating a safe, safe space, or as you all sat, say, counter space and hyperspaces um, to make sure that they feel and understand that they belong. This is not an invitation to this industry. Their lineage and culture has already contributed to it. So they have to take their rightful place. And that persistence is kind of like the connection to actually get there, the support, the re, you know, reinventing and, and evolving your identity is really important in this process as you navigate this pathway that in the current state is not built or was made for us, but ultimately we're trying to change it so that it centers us and our brilliance. So that has been the work of the organization kind of at a theory perspective. How we do it is we literally have said we need to equip educators 
in the, especially in the out of school time space. And I love that you all really recognize the power of the out of school time space environment where educators can take the TechBridge Girls curriculum that is gender and culturally responsive, that is grounded in our, our cultural lineage and be able to deliver it in an equitable way that checks their own biases and the way in which STEM education has been taught, but to kind of reshape the possibilities of how it should be for our girls. So that really is the center of our work is really being a catalyst of our curriculum through educators to deliver it. Um, and then we wanna take you know what you all do really, really well and how we met is to really elevate our voices of our girls, um, to not only talk about the challenges and the systemic issues that prevent our girls persistence, but the brilliance and the unique contributions that without our girls, without their journeys, without their identities would not STEM would not be what it is today. And so really building that narrative out from an asset perspective versus a deficit perspective. Yes, I love that perspective so much. I think that that's really central to the work that we do here at Vanguard STEM. Um, and a concept that we reiterate over and over again in our paper, which you should read if you haven't, shameless plug. Um, uh, and that is for the audience because everyone here has already, we, we are well versed in those counter spaces and hyper spaces. Um, but yes, I, I love that this is the perspective that Tech Bridge Girls takes in engaging the, uh, your communities. Um, and so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how you got into this particular work and what keeps you going on the day-to-day, -day, especially uh, now as it's, it's so difficult to come together in community or the ways that our communities engage have to look different? Well, there's no question that I sit in this position because it was divinely ordered for me to be in it. And the reason why I say that is because my career path was everything but what I didn't want it to be. <laughs> and I think that's important to sometimes say because, you know, it really is not a linear journey. Um, and sometimes you gotta do the thing, lean into the things that you're, you're running most away with because you never know how it is part of the toolkit to get you to your purpose work. And I think that that has been my journey. So I started my career at a global top tech company bringing high speed, my first project was working with engineers, bringing high speed internet into the consumer household. I mean, think about 20 years ago, this was going from dial up to high speed. For the millennials and younger in the room, it was used to call DSL, digital subscriber line. It's like when you put a cord in your computer to get high speed <laughs> internet, right? So I was part of that innovation. And as much as it was exciting, I really felt, and I've been reflecting because literally it's been 20 years, almost to the date that I walked into that building and, and met that team, how I felt that I did not necessarily belong at the table. I remember not having the confidence, not only because I didn't have a STEM background in the traditional sense, but because of the work that I was doing and, and I was the only lonely, right? Only black woman, only young person in the room, only person that didn't have a STEM degree. So I reflect a lot about that. And I've been reflecting a lot about that feeling that I had and now I think 20 years forward, I am able to engage, inspire thousands of Nicoles that no longer will not have the confidence, the voice, the agency, and the belief that they not only belong, but they have to contribute because without their contributions, you're not really reaping the full potential of the innovation or opportunity. So for me, I think it, I come to this work divinely, but it sits very squarely into my young Nicole self 
that is filling that gap that now I can fill for other girls. And so that's what motivates me because I know that feeling and I know the feeling of not feeling like you have a voice or trying to conform to a culture that was not created for you, trying to navigate and try to like hold on to your core identity, but also try to bob and weave in this other, you know, perceived identity that you should have. And so I think for me, the motivation is that I never want a girl to feel like that. And if I can instill that into her earlier than, than, than later, then that makes it even more um, attainable for her to stick and stay in this pathway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, is, that is some straight up like, uh, it's fire. So glad to be in this conversation with you. There are so many things that you hit on that I just, I just want to echo back and reflect and, and thank you for saying, right? Like that in particular, the point that Anika and you both were making about, you know, like it's not from a deficit model, right? Like we just refuse to countenance, countenance the notion that this has anything to do with a deficit uh, in these, in these girls, uh, in these uh, gender expansive youth, right? Like that's not what it is. And I think what resonated with us on the VS team with the work that you're doing is that those are the same concerns that we are uh, working for as folks move through the pipeline. And so it's really important to think through like the kinds of expressions of what contributing to and changing the STEM landscape means uh, that we actually don't want to sit at the table. <laughs> actually, we may not want to sit at the table. We, wanna, we may want to sit outside by uh, the waterfall, or we may want to lay down and do yoga while we right? like that. We're not trying to make folks conform into this thing. We really do want to create these equitable spaces. Um, and I want to particularly underscore something you said about using the out of school space, right? And, and to me, this resonates a lot with even this the sort of trying to cope with the pandemic uh, in 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 learning and being a part of community that one of the stories that I feel like we hear a lot from particularly uh, folks of color and marginalized folks is that there is there for those of us who have the privilege of being at home and working from home there's a certain safety that comes from that because there are so many oppressions and isms and frustrations and and uh, violences that happen in uh, for those of us who are working in the workspace and we've heard from young women and like you were saying and, and young uh, gender expansive folks that it happens at school too right so the out of space becomes then important for being able to build these generative spaces where we're not just responding to oppression being poured over us all the time, but that we can actually think expansively about what can be. So I, I for us, we are fangirling y'all because we, we know that you're starting them out young <laughs> in that way. And that allows for the growth over time. And maybe then the last point that I wanted to just echo back and underscore is your point about coming from political science and, and having a master's in public administration. Like we need you here, right? Like there are things you know how to do that they just don't teach us <laughs> when we're learning calculus or pipetting. And you can laugh at me all the time because I just don't understand being a lab. It just makes no sense to me. But like there, there are skills you bring up. And the reason why we wanted to do that Futurist Friday is to point out that like in order to build a healthy uh, STEM ecosystem, we we have to have folks that did not come from STEM with, with broad perspectives and ideas. And so we're grateful to have you here and to, and to have you have such a passion and love for developing and nurturing. I mean, because we know from the data that uh, young girls of color in particular show the same interest in science as their counterparts at the same age. So it's not even like we have to like convince them that this is something they want to do. What we ha What we're trying to do is leave enough space around them for them to blossom without being uh, unduly hurt by what's around them. So I just, you just, all of the fire. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think that this is a great place to maybe talk a little bit more about what it is that Tech Bridge, Tech Bridge Girls does in engaging uh, your students to contribute to that sense of access or belonging and persistence. I think that that's, that, that persistence is really what we here at Vanguard STEM try to cultivate. Because again, as we've said over and over again, that oftentimes uh, women and non-binary people of color in STEM 
uh, choose, choose different paths as an expression of their agency and, and not as a failure or as a sign of a lack of ability, but that, that persistence um, or, or, or the lack thereof for our communities is something that causes us to lose so many brilliant innovators in STEM specifically. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious as to what TechBridge Girls does um, and some of your core tenets that um, you could speak to that are around that framework. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, a great question. And we've evolved, you know, over our 20 years, um, you know, we've learned more, we deepened um, as I came in the organization and really um, asked the question, like, for what and for why are we doing this work? And to me, it was way more than diversifying an industry, you know, no offense. I mean, yes, that's great. But like, there is an economic, a social justice framework to this. Um, there is a, you know, innovation um, gap if we continue to intentionally leave a population of girls out of this STEM revolution. It's about the, the, the technology that is being created that if anything in the last year, STEM literally saved most of us. Right, so it is per, it is uh, critical for our future. And if our girls are not being the creators of it, then our communities will not be part of it. And so, for us, understanding all that richness, you know, we really have built a framework that says, number one. Um, the way in which STEM education needs to shift is really through what you all talk about around the, the current STEM culture, white, male, dominated, heteronormative, a normative, able-bodied, right? Like, how do you shift the no longer, I think of Albert Einstein as a scientist versus I think of an Anika, <laughs> right? Like, um, like, that is what we were trying to like shift. And the way that you do that, or the way that we're doing it at TechBridge Girls is through the work of storytelling by telling the stories of the black and brown brilliance that has revolutionized the industry, has revolutionized technology and centering that so that not only our girls see the reflection of their, of their culture and their lineage, lineage contributions already, but then gives them kind of a platform to leap off of, right? Um, we also, I mean, in the, of course, it's hands-on experience. I think that, you know, all education has talked about how when you enable, when you teach concepts, being able to touch it, feel it, do it, um, really enables um, girls to take take concepts to that reality and re real application. So we use hands-on um, STEM uh, activities to really get our girls, you know, leaning into the engineering design process that we know um, girls in, gen in general, um, women in general do have kind of a perfection complex, right? Like it has to be the best or I can't get it wrong or I'm, I'm apprehensive of failure. And so doing hands-on activities really starts to break down that cycle. It reduces that feeling of, you know, apprehension around failure and kind of turns it on failure is part of the process. And in actually it's part of the growing and growth of your learning. Um, so you have to go through it in order to get to better and better, right? Um, and then I think the last piece is really about the connection to social justice, right? And the connection to being a change maker in your community. So how do you create these STEM, how do you learn these STEM concepts, you know, do it um, to understand it, um, see it reflective in the people um, that are already in the world, making a difference around it, but then shifting and saying, well, I can do it too. And I can understand what are some of the challenges in my community and how some of these STEM concepts and disciplines can help me change those challenges, improve those um, environments in which I live in 
right now. So that helps build agency, that helps build leadership, that creates greater confidence, and they are literally seeing the connection of the critical impact and influence of STEM on their livelihood and future. So those are some of our key uh, pillars of our work um, that we feel are critical to connecting our girls from access to persistence, right? So getting this in front of them, but the persistence is really about giving them different in age development pathways of engaging in those key tenants so that they can ultimately have the tools to navigate when they excel to high school and beyond. Yeah, I, I think that that's so wonderful. And I, I one of the reasons that I love uh, Tech Bridge Girls and the work that you guys do so much is because I definitely see my childhood experiences with STEM reflected back in that. Um, and I, I often think back to the teachers that I've had, um, even commenting on my Facebook posts of the Vanguard STEM paper yesterday, my, my fourth grade science teacher um, and my middle school teachers and my high school teachers, where they were really able to foster that environment where, uh, like you said, it was hands-on experiences with STEM, where I was really able to find my passion. And I, I think that what you are building with Tech Bridge Girls is so wonderful. Uh, I, I can think of my experiences and compare them side by side and say that um, those girls will truly be able to succeed in STEM if they choose to, uh, based on the work that you guys are doing. It's, it's so wonderful. Um, but I, I'm going to hand it over to Jedida. I, I feel like I've done most of the talking here, just wearing you out. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, so to zoom out, thank you for giving us that sense of Tech Bridge Girls and the sense that we can educate, inspire, grant access and help uh, our next generation persist without asking them to assimilate into uh, preconceived notions of and really outdated notions of what a scientist is. It's incredibly powerful and actually quite rare. And I'm sure you know it, right? Like when you look across the sort of um, landscape, there's a lot of conversation often about like, well, of course you can be successful if you just become this model of what science should be. Right. And so thinking about uh, all of this from an equity frame uh, and not a diversity frame is actually incredibly powerful. And it's why we are so excited to be in contact with you. Um, and so, you know, I think pivoting now to a conversation about uh, the hyperspace and about why um, we from VS have been labeling and sort of trying to build um it, um, ideas around this sense of hyperspace, but wanting to connect it to this notion of STEM equity that you talked about before, right? That like who one is uh, helps to identify what problems they think are interesting to solve. Uh, one of my favorite examples about this is um, thinking back to when we first started to hear word about the Flint water crisis and the way that we actually were able to understand the impact and the extent of the, the water crisis was that communities distributed these tests and, and communities did those tests, right? Like that's community driven research, that's science. And it was done uh, in response to what was happening in their communities. And if we're being honest, it's, it had it was because of the many structural inequities that they faced, similar to the folks um, who are recovering ar around Houston, right? And we hope that everyone actually in Houston right now is safe and warm and has everything they need um, and thankfully the weather has broken, but like those are structural inequities that are constantly built up. So when we're thinking about STEM as, you know, for us, a, a tool for social justice, that's how we like to think about it. And we're thinking about helping these girls see uh, and gender ex expansive youth see themselves already. This, this point that you made earlier about they're already in the work, their histories, their lineages, who they are, are already in the work. Um, and so being in that, um, that frame to help teach them how to be, they're already here, <laughs> to teach them how to be a part of um, creating a new story um, is really powerful. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, how you help them think about building brighter futures. 
Yeah, well, come meet. Um, this is Xavier. <laughs> Hi, Xavier. <laughs> this is this is you know this is the real deal. Like this is being a mommy and um, you know preparing for uh, the transition to bedtime. You know, and we are um, here. For it. <laughs> so thank you for the audience for indulging um, my little one embarking on our space um, today. But the way in which we help um, our girls really create STEM equity, but the, their STEM identity is around centering them and centering their experiences, centering their brilliance, centering the interest and the realities in which they embark on every day. It's all contextualized. You know, I always say that it, it boggles my mind that this is such an issue, STEM education and equity and being able to serve and support um, a population in a specific way in which they need to be supported is so, um, you know, out of people's understanding because we do it every day with marketing, right? We do market research on a community, right? We, uh, we build the brand around their needs. We shift and evolve based on what they ultimately um, start to buy, right? Or not buy. And then we like double down on their needs so that then every product and, and aspect is, is geared to them specifically. I mean, that's how education should actually be. It's not rocket scientists to ask a girl, what does she need? What is of interest to her? How does she see STEM? And it's not through just going to STEM camp, but it's through her mama making tamales or it's through um, her dad, her supporting her dad in the, in the garage tinkering with the car. It's about what she might be doing with grandma in the garden. And it's around like the relatability of of understanding STEM through the context and the realities of our girls. And so for us, that's what equity is really. That is, that is how it starts is because you're making education contextual to the relevance of the experience of your consumer, right? Um, in a really simplified way, like that's how I think about it. And so um, for us, it's about how do we continue to go back to our girls, I mean, we have a youth advisory council that keeps us on check. If something is not fun, <laughs> if something is you know outdated, if something is not resonating, if they are bored, because remember, as as girls get older, especially middle school and and older, they vote with their feet. You know, it's not like elementary school where your mommy or dad or grandma told you to go to this after school program, right? Like literally they have a choice at that time. So we always have to stay at the pulse of our girls so that we are actually building a program, building a framework around them and it relates to them so that then it connects to like their reason to continue to persist. Yes, yes, like, yes. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, Kaz B just said, damn, Nicole is brilliant. And they're right. Um, <laughs> it is 100% true. Um, so let me just be clear that like that sentiment, like that is, if we could get the whole of STEM culture to understand that it would be amazing, right? Like thinking about the fact that, and this is why it's important to have folks that are outside of STEM in these conversations, because we have been talking about this notion of like, of course your identity influences your interests. Um, that's what we think of as our, our intersectional STEM identity. But to use an example of marketing to exactly convey that just did not occur to me. I won't blame that on anyone else. It didn't occur to me, but hearing you having had these other experiences and other exposures to other areas and bodies of work, it makes it make sense. And so it's, again, underscores why it's so important that you're here and you're making these interventions. Um, but responding directly to your point, like, that's it, right? That like, science, STEM is a culture. It is a demographic, uh, right? It is a certain set of cultural norms that folks have agreed upon that that seem like air, if that's the, um, let's say it this way, it seems like the water you're swimming in if you're a fish and you're swimming, but it's really hard to breathe in if you are say a tree dwelling animal, right? And so thinking about that, that like it is important to 
point out the water that we're swimming in at all times, even if it doesn't seem um, intuitive, because that is where the equity comes from. And then suiting the environment to folks to understand uh, what they, for us to understand what they need, it's just, that's where liberation comes, right? And so when we're thinking about hyperspace, when we're thinking about um, coming from a generative space and about STEM equity, we're, what we're saying is we, and this will sound familiar to you because we agree as organizations on this, right? Like we're not actually asking you for help, <laughs> like in terms of, should I be here? Can I be here? Is it okay? Like, that's not actually what we're asking for. Uh, if, you, if we want to be frank about it, what we're truly asking is for you to just get out of the way. If you could just step to the side so that we can do what we already know we can do, then we would be great, right? But it's, it's the fact that you can't stay out of our lane. You just always in the lane, right? So I just, I want to just really underscore that and, and to, to partake. And the other point I wanted to uh, just come back to is the voting with your feet, right? Um, this is a point Anika was making earlier, right? That like, there are many um, women of color, non-binary folks of color in STEM who are excellent at STEM, but the environment is so crappy, <laughs> right? That like they vote with their feet and they decide that they don't want to do that anymore. And that's a tremendous loss of talent for, for STEM fields, but it's also a constriction of their personal right to freedom and to self-express. Um, and so I think it, it, I don't know, for me, it just resonates how many of these issues Pers like persist such that we need to be building, um, first of all, tearing down uh, and then rebuilding systems that don't require so much um, grit, which is a very problematic term. Uh, so yeah, let me, let me throw that out there for see what y'all think. Well, I, I definitely think that one thing that we can talk about talk about around this conversation of, I think that we we tend to talk a lot about persistence when we're speaking about uh, women and non-binary people of color in STEM sort of in the area of higher education. So when we're talking about undergraduate and graduate programs, but I think that something that definitely um, this episode especially touches on in nurturing STEM identities is what that looks like at a young age. And so one of the things that we talked about a bit in our, our pre-show that I'd like to touch on is the concept of cyberbullying and how that is framed in the context of STEM identity. Um, so I, I can start with an anecdote. For me personally, one of the ways that I came to find Vanguard STEM was through that exact experience. I had a tweet that went viral where I calculated the angle of my dab and uh, at the names that I was called would uh, definitely check all of the boxes on the isms and phobias that we don't allow here that we talked about at the beginning of this episode. Um, and, and so that was something that was specifically targeted uh, at my STEM identity. And I know that in the age of TikTok and Twitter and Instagram, um, that, that that's something that young girls likely face nowadays as well. And so I was wondering if you had any insight or comment around um, the centering of STEM identity and blocking or uh, deflecting some of that maybe online um, uh, conflict that these girls might be seeing. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, it we know it happens, right? And so how do we equip our girls to navigate it? I think one place is about, like you all call it hyperspace, which I love. Um, I mean, we probably just use the word community. <laughs> That's not so sexy. Um, <laughs> I like hyperspace better. But there is this aspect of preparing, unfortunately, we are preparing our girls to navigate the current and transform it at the same time, right? And so the transform energy and power that they get from the Tech Rich Girls community allows them to navigate and have endurance for the culture that it is right now. And so what I can say is that, you know, the reality is we want you to speak loud and be proud about the STEM identity 
that you are creating, that you're evolving and that you're becoming into. And, you know, society <laughs> for generations have said you don't belong in this field, in this industry. You um, have to be a certain way, a nerd, uncool. I mean, <laughs> just my engagement with Vanguard STEM and all of all of you, that is definitely a, a you know, oxymoron. Like literally, cause you all are cool and trendy and like just fly, right? But like, so society has created this narrative that you can't be all these things and still be, you know, someone, a girl interested in STEM. So one thing is just to continue to foster belonging. So belonging is an internal feeling that is built so that even when you get in a space that you don't belong, you still can tap into that inner, inner spirit of belonging, right? And then you have a community, right? A community that you can go back to for us TechBridge girls. It's the community of self uh, or, or um, common interest girls, gender expansive youth that have created a space for us to explore, to celebrate, to you know question and lean into this STEM identity that I think I want to create or pursue. And then, you know, sometimes you, you know, this goes just maybe more because it's something that we start to um, teach our girls at a, a younger age through our social emotional learning. But what I translate it is, is really about teaching them self care and how to protect your peace. So, you know, you may need to mute some people. You may need to take a step back off of your social media. You may need to like, just give yourself um, your own space to be able to tap in and tap out when things, you know, you just hear too many of the negatives and to really, you know, prioritize that self care because as you all know, you need it going through this pathway. You need to know how to tap back into yourself and know when enough is enough that it's impacting my spirit or impacting my mental health or physical health that I need to like tap out, right? And protect that piece. So um, for TechBridge girls, because, you know, we're supporting elementary and middle school girls, um, we teach that through social emotional learning um, which is ultimately giving them the tools to self-care um, for their future so that then they can navigate. But it is creating that sense of belonging in a space and using the community of TechBridge girls to continue to get re-energized um, when you have to navigate in the counter, the, 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 the cultural space that has not been transformed yet. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's so much it. And I think, you know, I really appreciate your defining belonging in that way, because I think people misunderstand that term often, and they assume what it means is that, uh, again, it's that sort of seat at the table that what we want is to be brought into what currently is and function there. And that's truly not what it is. It, it is the ability to see, um, and like you said, the internal ability to see yourself as contributing to and influencing how these things are happening. And so I really appreciate that point. And, and the, the idea of equipping the, so the social emotional learning is, I mean, we may need to, we need, we may need to talk on the back end about how we can bring that into Vanguard stem. We can do some collaborative stuff there, but that's really important for when one runs hundred miles an hour into the brick wall that is structural oppression and racism, right? Uh, all, all the isms, racism, sexism, ableism, all of those things, homophobia, at all of it. Um, and to not internalize those things so that the internal process of feeling like one belongs remains protected. Um, and the, the part of it that is structural that tries to impose views of what you are and who you should be is instead what is sloughed off. And so I think that's a really, really, really important point that you made and to hear how you're helping um, all the way around the sort of 360 degree approach for your, um, your, your tech bridge girls uh, and community is really beautiful and amazing. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing. 
Uh, thank you again so much for joining us this evening, Nicole. It's been wonderful to talk with you about the work that you're really doing in exactly what we've called this show for tonight, nurturing STEM identities of girls and gender expansive youth. Um, thank you from me on behalf of the entire Vanguard STEM team, and I'm sure everyone watching in the comments and whatnot below. Um, can you let us know where people can find more information about TechBridge Girls um, or even like in, or, even, or even follow along with your ne other networks? Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Vanguard STEM. Thank you, community at large for having us. This is such, again, this just fills my heart. Um, we would love for the community to follow us on social media at TechBridge Girls. Um, you can visit us on our website at techbridgegirls.org. Um, and if people want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn or um, social media at Nicole Collins Pori via LinkedIn or Nicole C. Pori on Twitter. Um, just note that the Nicole is spelled with a K. So, um, you know, you could hopefully find me. I'm not Nicole Hannah <laughs> Jones, but like there's not many Nicoles with a K. So um, feel free to follow me and get more information about us and the organization and the work that we are doing to try to transform this um, STEM um, education space so that our girls can continue to thrive and flourish in it. You are much appreciated. We can't wait till the next time to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Be well. Okay, y'all. So we're switching to the next phase of our show, which is our BS Gets Lit book club feature, we are going to bring on Dr. Malika Grayson, and she's going to give us a word about boop, her book. So we're very, very, very excited uh, to have Dr. Grayson come into our discussion. Uh, so let me just, there she go. Let me just introduce her. She is the queen of all things. That's the, that's the conservative description of uh, Dr. Malika Grayson. Um, I have been a long time uh, admirer of her and her work. Uh, we were talking before the show about how I have been watching her be great since the Black Girls Guide to Graduate School, which I think she's going to give you an update on, uh, but she would read and edit, uh, every time I get this wrong, uh, uh, personal statements and resumes and such for uh, uh, Black girls trying to get into graduate school. So I have been a fan uh, for a long time. Uh, but Dr. Grayson is also the founder of Steminist Empowered LLC, uh, which is focused on the empowerment of Black women who pursue graduate degrees through uh, personal statement reviews. There it is. It's written right there. Look at me. Uh, and graduate <laughs> mentorship. Uh, she's also a Fortune 100 global speaker, a number one global bestselling author, boss. She didn't write that. I just said it. Uh, author and engineer. Uh, she's incredibly talented, um, beautifully uh, generous, and it's a pleasure to have her on board. Um, so without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, the featured author of our VS Gets Lit book club, Dr. Malika Grayson. Thank you so much for coming. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. That was amazing. I have to take you everywhere. You're the best hype woman ever high person ever amazing but i'm so excited to be here you know just having us connect finally and then being able to meet your team while i was going to grad school you were like one of my motivational people you know a pillar that i could look at and i was a fan and been fan girling so when you reached out i couldn't believe it i said this is you know it's like full circle so so mutual, the feeling is mutual. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so we want to make sure to get to your book, which is amazing. Um, can you tell us, first off, um, what made you write this book? Give us the whole lowdown. Like, how did we get this book in our hands? No, that's, that's a great question. So I graduated in 2016. And, you know, let's just throw it back to the first time I'm walking into my cohort, PhD, Callhood, and I look around and I'm like, where, where are the people who look like me? And, you know, only to find out that I was the only person of color in my cohort. I was the only black person in my cohort. I was the only black woman. 
And then eventually when I graduated, I'll be the only second black woman to graduate with a PhD in mechanical engineering, right? So it was almost like, well, there isn't even anyone I can go to, to talk about the things that I'm feeling because I'm in this mechanical engineering program, which, you know, for those familiar with engineering, mechanical engineering is very male dominant and it makes it very hard to find female outlets or female people, um, people that you can go to, right? Not just who look like you, but even women in general. And once I graduated, I think we, we talk about trauma in graduate school all the time. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about, where you go through it and it's almost like you need a moment to recuperate. You need a moment to take a pause. And that is what I needed. I needed some time to figure out my feelings about my whole process, my feelings about that journey. And once I did that, I decided, okay, how can I give back? And how can I put all that I was feeling into action? And that is what led me to create Black Girls Guide to Graduate School, which started off as a blog, uh, just on my living room floor. I really just wanted to write my feelings and write some of the, the tips that I thought people should know and some of the things I wish that I knew about my experience, right? And so one blog piece turned into two and then eventually one person asked me about personal statements and so Black Girls Guide to grad school grew into not just this blog that I would write, but then also certain times of the year, I'll do personal statement reviews. So four years later, five years later, 140 plus essays later, here we are, because I felt as if even though I was putting all these blogs in terms of being consistent, I didn't think it was giving people enough detail and enough depth when it came to the experiences. And the rate I was going when it came to blog posts, I'm like, you need to know everything right now because you need to feel as if you're not alone on your journey. And that is really what motivated me. And you know, I, I stopped and I started this book a lot because every other time I would write a paragraph, I felt as if my, what I had to say wasn't valid enough. Who cares? And we feel that about a lot of things, right? That we do. And I would have to really motivate myself or I would do a review, review a statement for someone. And then just the feeling I would get when they told me I really helped them, I said, okay, it's time for me to share my story so that other people understand that they aren't alone. So that's how we got here, essentially. I'm so I never want you to be alone and or any of the black women, uh, BIPOC women, non-binary folks of color and STEM. It's it is a crappy feeling. I know the feeling. Um, so we never want that, but I'm so glad that you wrote this book. It's such an incredible um, gift. Uh, and it's such a generous thing to do. Um, one of the things that struck me, because you know I had to read it, like, of course I was going to read your book, like, I read your blog post, so of course I was going to read your book, but um, one of the things that struck me about it is the way, the way that you wrote it, right, like, it is very much structurally built to walk you through, like, it's literally written in years, and it has workshop, uh, work, um, worksheets and and reflections and the like right thank you Anika thank you uh, so what even writing the book is one thing but then writing in that way is another and so what made you pick that as a format uh, for folks to to read it was really just my thought process because I had to think of it it was me reliving graduate school and so as I relived graduate school I wrote it in the way I was reliving it this is literally me, okay, how did I feel on day one? And I talk a little bit about that maybe in the prologue or something. And what was the next major thing that happened for me in year one? Choosing an advisor, what was the second major thing? And so I go through all those milestones um, and that is really how it ends up being because I want you to understand it's, it's exactly what I was going through, it's sequential, right? And that was that timeline. So it just happened that it works out perfectly because along the, it's along the lines of what most of us go through when we're going through the graduate program. It's the, the year one of trying to figure it out, going to class, feeling as if you have nothing figured out. Year two of, okay, I'm, I'm getting in there, but I need to figure out what my research topic is. Year three, I'm in the middle, I'm in this tunnel. I don't see the light in front of me, but it's also too dark for me to turn around. And then year four, 
I, I see the light almost, but I'm so overwhelmed by a million different things. I'm thinking about my future. I don't know what to do. And then, you know, year five. So it really was me reliving every single year. And that's why I had to take a pause sometimes because in certain years, you have to relive some traumatic experiences in graduate school. And to have to go through those feelings again, I needed to get to the place where this is me in that moment and this is how I feel. So I could put it down on paper. I know I definitely appreciate how this book is written. I feel like there's so much that you can take away from it. You can read the, you can read Hooded for the narrative. You can read it for the information about what to expect throughout grad school. Um, and then you can even use it as a tool like Jedida mentioned with the many places to write in and think through your own uh, goals and priorities through grad school. Um, I know when, when my copy came in the mail, I thought to myself, well, I have, I've got to read this for the, the VS Gets Lit um, book club. I'm definitely going to read it. Uh, but I, I wonder how much I'll get out of it as, you know, fourth year in my PhD program. Right. And it was, it was so funny to me. I opened the book and I kid you not, it was the page where it said I was however many hundred days out from graduation when I started <laughs> looking for a job. And I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe I opened the book and immediately was called yeah, out at the cool. exact place where I am in my um, doctoral journey. Uh, so I, I definitely would say that I couldn't recommend this book enough to someone who is wanting to go into um, a doctoral program. But even if you're already in the midst of it, I think that this is a wonderful book to read at any stage um, for anyone in, in the graduate school process. Yeah, I think you know it's really important to have the, not just the reflective pieces, because you know, they're reflection questions at the back of each chapter, because these are questions I ask myself. And I think these are questions we all ask ourselves. And it's important to just bring, you know, bring yourself back to, to zero. Um, and these questions help me do that. But also just some tools I wish I had. Some tools when I um, say, okay, what is the budget breakdown? You know. Balling on a budget in graduate school is a task. And if you can do it, you're a winner. But also when it came to taking criticism, I had to figure out how to really take criticism and not have it discourage me from going to school in the morning or going to lab in the morning and feeling as if, well, you know, I just got all that feedback. What is the point of even running this experiment? And I think it was important for me to really go through that to see where I went wrong or where I could have had the opportunity to be better so that other people can do the same. So good, so good. I know we're coming up towards the top of the hour, but I just, I wanted to highlight some, beyond the, the generosity in the book, the structure, the calling out apparently, uh, as Anika pointed out, the straight up, calling out. Um, there's also, you also just mentioned specific things that I think a lot of us, particularly uh, Black women uh, in STEM have, have gone through before. And I just wanted to point to some of them uh, and thank you for writing them, but also just encourage folks who are watching to, to keep in mind the kind of like resonance you may feel. So, you know, it's in your year one and you're talking about coming to campus, getting acclimated. Um, and then you talked about how you had made the decision that you wanted to defer your qualifier a little bit and then having to go and talk to your chair about that and receiving not at all an enthusiastic or encouraging um, response back. And I thought that your whole conversation about that, about like how it was deeply impactful to you, but that like you came um, through and talked about that you were here for you. You weren't here for any other reason than to get the thing that you came here to get. And I just wonder if you could um, maybe expand on that story just a little bit uh, for our audience and talk through how you got from hearing someone express such doubt to you directly to your face to being like, no, this is what I need to do and this is what I'm going to do. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I remember that like it's yesterday, right? I decided that I wanted to defer my qualifier because I was coming from a physics background to a mechanical engineering PhD, um, mechanical engineering space. And I had never taken an engineering course before. 
And I was truly overwhelmed, not just by the coursework, but just by what I needed to, to get done. And, you know, I feel as if qualifiers are different depending on the school, but there are these standardized tests. I, I feel like sometimes they can be these standardized tests that it could really make or break people, you know, because you feel as if, if you feel it, you feel as if you're not good enough to get a PhD and that's not how it's supposed to be. And it really is supposed to help assess you to see where you need work. But I think the way it's introduced in many institutions, um, it doesn't do that. And, you know, for me, I thought I was being mature and letting myself know, okay, girl, you need to pause because you are not ready. And I did that and I spoke to my advisor and he was supportive and he understood. And, you know, I went to the chair and it, it just wasn't the same way, you know, his reaction was basically asking me if I thought I would be ready in six months, which would be the, the next opportunity to, to take it. And what if I wasn't? And I think I didn't expect that. And once I got that, it really made me question myself because I asked myself, what if I'm not ready? What if I don't have all the answers in the room the next time and then I fail? Or is it me just trying to cop up because I don't think I belong here. And I had to really figure out what I wanted to do. And I need to, I needed to, first of all, I talk a lot about my mom in a couple of the, the chapters. So she's always the first person I call when something goes wrong. I'm like, you wouldn't believe what this man told me. And, but, you know, so she's also been, she's always been that, that um, foundation I can go to, to bring me back down and calm me when I feel as if I'm really overwhelmed. And one of the conversations I remember us having was that same one you talked about is who are you doing this for? Are you going to let people or let an institution um, or the people in an institution tell you what you are meant to do in this place, what you are meant to do in this space, just because you were mature enough or you were conscious enough to know that you didn't want to go and put yourself in a position where you know you would fail. And I think sometimes we, we do things that are brave for us and we don't get the support that we're supposed to get. And I really had to remind myself that I was doing something that was best for my success and it was best for me to delay it. And because I knew that, I knew I belong there. So that that's a, a convoluted way, but that is basically how that you came back. But it's perfect. And and now we're talking to Dr. Dr. Malika Grayson. So I, it sounds as if it works. It's what I'm hearing. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And you know, it makes me think of this point that I try to tell my mentees when we're in these moments where they've received um, critical feedback that is, is um, sort of driven by racism or other oppressions is that often we have fears that are in our head. Uh, and then when people say those fears out loud, it's like a resonance chamber. And it seems like, oh my goodness, I've been found out. They now know, but it doesn't make it any more true. Right. And so I'm so glad you had that grounding feature with your mom to like help you remember what's true in, in the work that we do at VS. We think about that as like meaningful others, the folks that whose opinions we value that help us understand like, why we are doing what we're doing and help us ground around that. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. So we want to be mindful of your time uh, and to our audience's time. And so we're not going to like, I mean, because we could keep you all here all day. I feel like there's a whole book we should be talking about. And we may need to circle back to this point. Um, but uh, as we're closing, can you tell people where they can, first of all, find you online uh, and where they can find your book? And I'm just going to do a quick plug here to say we are giving away one more free copy of Dr. Grayson's book. So uh, tune into our social medias tomorrow to see how you can do that. But for those who may not be able to do that, tell us how to find you and how to find your book. So you can find me on social media, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Malika Grayson, um, social media, Instagram, Dr. Malika, so DR Malika Grayson, Twitter, Malika Grayson. I think I just changed my Twitter handle, but if you search me, you'll find me. And my website is malikagrayson.com. And on my website, you'll find my book and you'll learn more about Black Girls Guide to Grad School and Steminist Empowered. And, you know, Steminist Empowered, we are going to be launching a mentorship program. So if you are someone who's in graduate school, 
and you are looking for a mentorship program, feel free to reach out to me because I'm selecting maybe eight to 10 women to work with throughout the next six months. Uh, so could they be faculty members that teach <laughs> astrophys? I'm just, I'm just- I'll also for- take on faculty members who <laughs> would like to do a session for our mentees. How about that? <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Grayson, for joining us. Again, thank you for your um, kindness and generosity to do this work uh, and for sharing your story with us. It will, it has already, and it will continue to change people. Um, If you don't remember, it is called Hooded, A Black Girl's Guide to the PhD. It's by Dr. Malika Grayson. We are super excited to feature her in our book club, uh, and you should definitely get her book. So we're wrapping up. Thank you so much for watching. Um, We are incredibly grateful for your support. We're grateful for to have you here um, and to be a part of our VS Village and to help us as we're building the VS hyperspace. Um, please subscribe in whatever direction that is just around here. Some that, that, All of that, do that, subscribe, <laughs> right? Like everybody point in a direction, subscribe. Um, we're already building for our March content. Uh, we can't wait to break our M- March VS Gets Lit Book Club feature. Y'all are like, we started strong with Dr. Grayson. We are gonna continue strong with our March book. We're so excited. Um, and also you can find us on uh, Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us now on YouTube. Please subscribe if you haven't, have I said that? Anyway, um, and then also please do stay safe uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we know there's a lot going on. We try to make this space a space where you can come um, and breathe a little bit easier, but we know life out here is hard in these streets. So please do take care of yourselves. Um, as you go. Uh, and I get, we, I would be remiss if I did not thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for uh, funding to help us bring the show uh, back to you this year. So uh, with that, I think, I think we've got a show people. So thank you for coming. We hope you have a great night. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Thank you to my amazing co-host, Anika Harriet. Uh, thank you to Nicole Collins, Puri, Pori, who was here earlier. We're very grateful for you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.